So today we're, <clears throat> excuse me, talking about activity-based costing and learning about um, what it is and how it differs from the traditional costing systems. Learning about how to assign costs to different cost pools using what's called the first stage allocation and computing activity rates. And also assigning costs to a cost object using what's called the second stage allocation. And using activity-based costing to compute product and customer margins. And of course, we will make some comparisons on product costs and how they're computed using traditional costing methods and activity-based costing methods. And we will have some time to look at the appendix or summary of it anyways. Talk about um, activity-based costing techniques for computing unit product costs for external reports and using time-driven activity-based costing. So activity-based costing is designed to provide managers with cost information for strategic decisions and other decisions that will potentially affect uh, the capacity of um, production and therefore affect fixed as well as variable costs. And activity-based costing is typically used as a supplement to a company's usual costing system. ABC or activity-based costing, it's designed for internal decision-making and therefore it differs from traditional cost accounting in a number of ways. For one, non-manufacturing as well as manufacturing costs can be assigned to products, but only on a cause and effect basis. And we will see how that uh, works out further in the presentation here. Some manufacturing costs may be excluded from product costs under activity-based costing. Numerous overhead cost pools are used with its own unique measure of activity to determine costing and overhead rates or activity rates may be based on one level activity at capacity rather than on the budgeted level of activity. In activity-based costing, we will also be determining the entire cost of a product rather than just its manufacturing cost, which can be very useful as we'll see in the lecture. And products are assigned all of the overhead costs in activity-based costing, both non-manufacturing non as well as manufacturing that they can reasonably be estimated to have caused. Also under traditional cost accounting, um, all manufacturing pro costs are assigned to products, even manufacturing costs that are not caused by those products. And under activity-based costing systems, we only assign costs to a product if there's a good reason to believe that the cost will be affected by decisions concerning the product. And activity-based costing products are only charged for the costs of capacity that they use and costs of idle capacity are considered to be period costs rather than product costs. So it's a little graphic <laughs> comparing the uh, differences between traditional costs and ABC. So traditional is on the top of the, the first graphic where you see a manufacturing cost and non-manufacturing costs. In activity-based costing, which is at the bottom of the graphic, you'll see that we have indirect costs from manufacturing costs and indirect costs from non-manufacturing costs that will both be um, considered overhead costs and they will either be assigned to products through an activity measure or to period the period itself. So under activity-based costing, we use more cost pools and unique measures of activity so that we can have a better understanding of the costs of managing and sustaining diverse products. So for the purposes of activity-based costing, 
an activity is an event that causes the consumption of overhead resources. An activity cost pool is like a bucket of costs in which uh, the costs in that bucket are related to a particular activity measure as they are accumulated. And an activity measure is an allocation base under an activity-based costing system. And we also call it a cost driver. And the two common types are transaction drivers and duration drivers. So a transaction driver is simply based on a count of the number of times that, that act, uh, an activity occurs. Whereas a duration driver is a measure of the amount of time needed for an activity. So something like labor hours would be how many labor hours are needed for a particular activity it would be a duration driver. And the transaction driver would be the number of times that activity occurs. So uh, the number of times that a product moves through a particular press, for instance, or a particular dyeing or um, application process, for, for instance. Traditional um, cost systems usually rely on volume measures, as we've seen in recent lectures, and those are measures such as direct labor hours and or machine hours to allocate all overhead costs to products. And under activity-based costing, it defines five levels of activity that largely do not relate to the volume of products produced. So typically manufacturing companies will combine their activities into five classifications. And those are unit level activities, batch level activities, product level activities, organization sustaining activities, and customer level activities. And when we're designing an activity-based costing system, we need to know our cost objects, such as products and customers. Uh, of course, what those activity, what activities are directly a part of those products or servicing those customers, what resources we consume in the process, and then of course, identifying the cost of those activities and resources. So when we're designing uh, an activity-based costing system, the steps we can use are to identify and define the activities and the activity cost pools and activity measures. Then we have to take our overhead costs and we assign those to activity cost pools. And then we calculate the activity rates, assign overhead costs to cost objects using the activity rates and activity measures. And then we can prepare management reports and we'll go through examples of that here. So we have a company called Classic Brass, which makes uh, various brass fittings, <clears throat> excuse me, Manufacturing overhead is allocated to products using a single plant-wide overhead rate based on machine hours. So we'll see our manufacturing overhead there that has been assigned using traditional costing methods for classic brass. Now, the activity-based costing team at Classic Brass has selected um, some activity cost pools and activity measures. So those pools are customer orders, product design, order size, customer relations, and other. For customer orders, the activity measure is the number of customer orders. For product design, it's the number of product designs. For order size, the measure will be based on machine hours. For customer relations, the measure will be based on the number of active customers. And for other costs, it won't be applicable in terms of having an activity measure. So just looking a little bit deeper into these um, activities and the activity cost pools and measures. So for customer orders, all assigned all costs of resources that are consumed by taking and processing customer orders. So that's how under this system, activity-based costing, we're going to determine how to apply costs to customer orders for product designs. 
all assigned costs or assigned all costs of resources consumed by designing products. So anything that's involved with the product design, order size, all assigned, assigned all costs of resources consumed as a consequence of the number of or units produced. So again, catching other costs that uh, don't fit into customer orders or the product design activities measures. Customer relations will involve assigned all assigned assigning all costs that are associated with maintaining relations with customers. So that's you know sales and marketing and customer relationships and <clears throat> there's a lot of stuff, right? I don't know how many of you uh, what your state in the workforce is, but there's a lot of relationship building that goes into customer relations in terms of sales, and maintaining that relationship. And then for other, it's assigned all overhead costs that are not associated with one of the other cost pools. So it's a bit of a miscellaneous or catch-all for things that are related to the cost of the products, but can't be assigned to one of those other pools. And we noted before that activity-based costing um, you sign pool, uh, sign overhead costs to the cost pools using a two-stage process. So we have direct costs that we will identify, such as material, lab materials, labor, and other. And you'll see a little bit clearer when we go through some numbers. And then in stage, we also have overhead costs that are our first stage allocations, such as manufacturing and non-manufacturing. And then we have our activity cost pools which in things like batch setups, product design, et cetera, that are part of our second stage allocations. And you'll see how this works a little bit clearer here. So overhead costs at Classic Brass have been identified as follows. Uh, these are both manufacturing and non-manufacturing. We have indirect wages at the factory, uh, depreciation for factory equipment, factory utilities, the building lease for the factory. And we also have our general, general administrative department, for, so administrative wages and salaries, office equipment and depreciation and administrative building lease. And then we have our marketing costs. So we have marketing wages and salaries and selling expenses. So we have total overhead costs for, uh, from those three departments. Direct materials, direct labor, and shipping have been excluded from these costs because uh, Classic Brass's existing cost system can directly trace the costs of direct materials and direct labor and shipping to products or to customer orders already. So it's these other overhead costs we're dealing with. So at Classic Brass, they've determined that the distribution of resource consumption is as follows across each activity. So we won't go through every single one, but we'll go through a couple to give you the idea here. In direct factory wages, um, they've determined that 25% of those costs go to customer orders, 40% are to product design, 20% goes to order size, 10% to customer relations, and 5% to other. For marketing, we'll see that marketing under marketing wages and salaries, 22% goes to customer orders, 8% goes to customer or product design, 0% goes to order size, 60% goes to customer relations, and 10% goes to other. So of course, these are always going to total up to 100%. You're just allocating a percentage to each, each activity cost pool that's been identified. So, <clears throat> pardon me, in terms of assigning overhead costs to the activity cost pools, uh, we've determined that our indirect factory wages are 500,000 and 25% of that is consumed by customer orders. So we can allocate 125,000 of indirect fast factory wages to the customer orders activity base. Similarly, with um, factory equipment depreciation, we can allocate 20% of that cost to customer orders. So just showing how we go through that, um, oh, how we go through this chart 
using the percentages that we've determined in uh, the activity cost pools and then allocating the manufacturing and non-manufacturing costs that haven't already been allocated because they're not as easy to trace as in other processes. So this would be the breakdown if we take the, the chart with the percentages allocated to each activity cost pool. And then we work through the costs that we had under these uh, under production department, general administrative department, marketing department. So you'll see how that breaks down. So factory building lease, um, you'll see it goes all under other. Uh, the administrative building lease goes all under other but most uh, pretty much all the other costs have been broken up into two or more activity cost pools based on those percentages that were determined for each cost pool. So at Classic Brass, the activity-based costing team has determined that they will have total activities for each activity cost pool. And those number, those total activities will be 1,000 customer orders, 400 new designs, 20,000 machine hours, 250 customer relations activities. So now the team can use that information to compute the individual activity rates. And that's just done by dividing the total cost of each activity by the total activity level. So it's just taking those the total activity level that was identified. Uh, we have the costs already for each activity. And so we can break down each activity cost pool into a cost per activity rate, right? So for customer orders, it's $320 per order. For product design, it's $630 per design. Uh, for order size, it's $19 per machine hour. And for customer relations, it's $1,470 per customer. And for other, it's not based on activity. That was those two uh, leasing costs for the administrative office and the factory itself. So looking at how we use the, um, how we apply the activity-based costing model in the case of, case of classic brass, as noted, we already can directly trace direct materials, direct labor and shipping costs. We can directly trace that easily under our current system. So we are going to use activity-based costing to allocate uh, manufacturing and non-manufacturing costs of 1,810,000. We can allocate that based on um, the percentages of use for each activity that we did in our first set of calculations. So that's where these numbers of 320,000 for customer orders come from, uh, et cetera. And then the second stage allocation, remember we just did that where we took the uh, cost per activity item, customer orders, product designs, order size, customer relations, and other. And we divided that by um, an indicator, by an actual activity like we did here, see? And then we have some unallocated ones, which is those uh, rental rates. So now that we've done this and we have an activity-based costing model that where we know that there's $320 per order that we're going to assign $630 per design, $19 per machine hour, and $1,470 per customer, we can take an actual product and uh, the two products that we're going to be looking at are standard stack-ins and custom compass housing. So for the standard stack-ins, there's no new design required because it's already been done and there's no changes. And there are 30,000 units ordered for 600 separate orders. Each stack-in requires 35 minutes of machine time for a total of 17,500 machine hours for the, all the units that um, have been or are being produced. For custom compass housing, uh, there are, of course, are going to be required um, new design resources because it is a custom job. There are 400 separate orders for custom compass housing and 400 custom designs prepared. 
and there are 1,250 custom housings produced requiring two machine hours each for 2,500 total machine hours for compass, custom compasses or compass housings. So <clears throat> next we're going to assign our overhead to these products and the customer level cost is assigned to customers directly. It's not assigned to the products in this case. So we have activity cost pools using customer orders, product design and order size. We have our activity rate for standard brass that we um, had already determined a few slides back. And all we're using now is our specific activity rate for standard stack ins at the top, which is 600 customer orders. So for the customer order cost pool for standard stack ins, we have $192,000 of costs there. For product design, there is no additional cost for the standard stack ins. So there's no cost allocated there on the second line. And in terms of order size, uh, we have 19 orders or the activity rate is $19 per order and the activity is or per, the total units is 17,500. So that's how many units we're doing in total for standard stack ins. So for this product, the overhead costs are $524,500. Now with custom housing, it is quite a bit different because um, we have much different activity levels. So we're using the same activity rate in the second column for 320 per customer order, 630 uh, per customer design, and $19 per order. So we have 400 customer orders, which gives us our customer order cost for custom housing, 128,000. We have uh, 400 product designs being done, giving us a cost of 252,000 and 2,500 orders, giving us a cost of 47,500. So for these overhead costs that we're working with, we have assigned 427,500 to custom housing and 524,500 to standard stack-ins. So how would our classic brass activity-based costing system work for just one of the 250 customers. In this case, it's a customer called Windward Yachts and Windward Yachts has placed a total of three orders. So we have two orders for 150 standard stack ins per order and one order for custom compass housing for Windward Yachts. We determined that um, there is a total of 177 machine hours used for this uh, custom order and that's 300 standard stack ins are requiring 175 machine hours and the custom compass housing requires two machine hours so we were, were given our orders as three for windward yachts we're doing one product design on that custom housing and the order size was given to us of 177 units and it's one customer. So our customer relations cost assigned to Windward Yachts is based on one unit at 1470. So you'll see total costs for this, um, this customer being $6,423. And this is all based on the activity rates that we had calculated previously for uh, classic brass and sorry, and then these specific customer numbers from Windward Yachts that were given to us on this uh, particular slide here. So that's where these figures come from and how we get the cost assignment. So it's pretty, it can be very simple when you're doing it on the basis of one customer. It's just that you'd have to go through and get all these activity rates first. <clears throat> Excuse me, that's something you might see in a question is, <clears throat> pardon me, I'm sorry you'd have to go through and do a multi-step where you calculate activity rates and then you use the specific activity under given cost pools to calculate per customer. Now we can, uh, of course, we always want to use product margins um, under management reports. So they're very important to determine what our um, costs are and how much margin we have to work with in terms of um, achieving profitability overall 
for various um, products and services that we're producing. And to get our project product margin calculations using activity-based cost, and the first step we're going to take is um, to gather each product sales and direct cost data. So we're still working with standard stack ins and custom compass housings for classic brass. So we have total sales for each one, and we have direct costs, which we can identify as direct to material, direct labor and shipping for each type of product. Now we use our computed uh, activity based cost rates to assign additional cost to each product. So in this case, we're assigning 100 new, 192,000 in costs for customer order orders to standard stack ins, 128,000 in costs for customer orders to custom compass housing. Product design only applies to custom compass housing. And uh, we're assigning $252,000 costs there. And then order size is assigned based on the number of orders. So we have about uh, 800, or $950,000, $970,000 in costs that we're going to assign. And so once we've identified those costs, we can compute project product margins by deducting each product's direct and indirect costs from the sales of the product, as you'll recall from your financial accounting class. So we've added, uh, we had direct material, direct labor and direct shipping already clearly identified for each product. And now we've split up customer order costs amongst each product using our activity-based costing system and product design and order size costs. So we're able to identify our total product margin for standard stack ins is $906,250. And for custom compass housings, our product margin is negative 49,500. And we'll see how that compares uh, shortly under using a different costing system. And of course we can reconcile um, our product margins with the company's net operating income by just taking sales, total costs, and we get our product margins for each product that we previously calculated. And then we can assign, uh, subtract costs that um, are not assigned directly to products such as customer relations and other. In this case, we have identified that there's a net operating loss of $1,250. Now, using um, ABC activity based costing and what we already know about other accounting processes, we can calculate customer profitability and, and we can do that for windward yachts. And so, what we've done first is we know what our sales are $11,350. Our direct costs are easily identified with our system. We have direct material, direct labor, and shipping for Woundward Yachts easily identified. Now we're going to assign previously computed activity-based costing to Woundward Yachts as well. And that's based on customer orders, pro product design, order size, and customer relations. We have these costs to assign of 960, 630, 3363 and 1470. And so we can have very good costing data on a customer basis using this system. And for windward yachts, we can determine that we have a customer margin of $699. And this, uh, things like this are very useful, right? I mean, <laughs> with something like Windward Yachts, we only have one customer, but, uh, you know, we know that we're not making a lot of money off of Windward Yachts and we have other customers that we're going to be making um, significantly more off of than Windward Yachts, right? So it's a matter, you know, it helps us to also determine how we allocate um, effort and things like that to uh, a particular customer. So using the traditional costing system, 
for the custom brass example, the first thing we would have done is computing project margins, computing product margins, margins um, is we'd gather each product's sales and direct cost data. And under the uh, traditional system, it's going to be a little bit different, you'll see. And then we would determine a plant-wide overhead rate, which we did two chapters back, I believe. So we do that using the total manufacturing overhead and dividing it by total machine hours in the case of custom brass to determine the plant-wide overhead rate, which is a pretty standard way of determining a uh, plant-wide overhead rate, as you recall from a couple chapters ago. Let me go backwards or forwards. Yeah, okay. Then the next step would be allocating manufacturing overhead to each product. And we do that on the basis of, basis of machine hours used for each product and that overhead rate, All right? And just multiply it through. So for standard stack ins, it's uh, 875,000 and overhead allocated based on 1,700, 17,500 machine hours. And for custom compass housing, it's based on 2,500 machine hours to give us overhead allocated of 125,000. So keep in mind, this is under the traditional cost system. And then we determine our selling and administrative expenses and subtract that from our overall margin that we've calculated on the left-hand side of this chart here, right? And margin is just your sales divided by, or your sales less your uh, variable costs uh, or cost of goods sold that's usually um, allocated under. And then that leaves us our selling and administrative costs to deduct and we have an operating loss of $1,250. Sorry, I keep hitting buttons a little too fast. My new computer's a little sensitive here. So between comparing activity-based costing and traditional product costs, um, our margins are uh, gonna be different under the two systems. Our margins using uh, the traditional costing for standard stackings, our margin is 615,750 using activity-based costing, the product margins are $906,250. Uh, under traditional costing, as you'll see, the custom compass housing, we're showing product margins of 258,000. So there's a big difference here compared to the product margins we calculate using activity-based costing, which is a negative product margin for custom compass housings of 49,500. So, the traditional cost system, in the case of classic brass, it overcosts the standard stack ins and reports a lower product margin for this cost. And it significantly undercosts the custom compass housing and reports a much higher product margin under traditional costing, as you see in the numbers there. So, just to go through and note some of the differences um, between activity-based costing and traditional product costs. There are three reasons why reported product margins for the two costing systems differ from one another. The first is that traditional costing allocates manufacturing overhead to products, while activity-based costing only assigns manufacturing overhead costs consumed by products to those products. So traditional costing takes all overhead and assigns a part of it, a piece of that overhead to each product that's produced, um, whether the product consumes that overhead or not. Whereas activity-based costing, you're only charging overhead to the product if it's actually consuming overhead. Traditional costing allocates all manufacturing overhead costs using a volume related allocation base and activity-based costing uses non-volume related activity or allocation bases. Traditional costing also disregards selling and administrative expenses because they're assumed to be period expenses. So they're just calculated on the basis of the accounting period. Whereas activity-based costing 
directly traces shipping costs to products and includes non-manufacturing overhead costs caused by products in the activity cost pools that are assigned to those products. So as we saw in, um, in our calculations for custom brass, we were assigning selling and administrative expenses to products based on what we determined um, those products used. So we can also use activity-based costing in conjunction with what's called activity-based management to identify areas that would benefit from process improvements. And the theory of constraints approach is gonna be discussed in chapter 12, and that's a powerful tool for targeting uh, improvements. Activity rates can also provide very valuable clues, clues on where to focus our improvement efforts. And benchmarking can also be used to compare activity cost information with uh, world-class standards of performance achieved by other organizations. So you can, you'll see with manufacturing, there's a lot of different uh, um, certifications that can be acquired. Uh, some of you might have heard of ISO, which is International Standards Organization, I believe. And that has a number of different standards that can be used for different manufacturing processes. And that's an example of what benchmarking is. So. Uh, and the purpose of benchmarking is to set a, um, a standard that is across an industry, basically around the world, so that you can set your targets for costing and things like product margins based on what um, the worldwide data is, essentially. That's what benchmarking would be. So with external reporting in our activity-based costing, um, most companies are not going to use your activity-based costing in external reports because the external reports are often going to be less detailed than what you're using internally. Um, it can be difficult to make changes to the company's accounting system. And uh, the big one is activity-based costing does not conform to GAAP. So if you're dealing with, um, like you can't use an audited financial statements, for instance. Um, and auditors may be suspect of the subjective allocation process based on interviews with employees. So auditors will go through a process of talking to employees when they're doing auditing and you know asking them relevant information about how they how to allocate costs and if they think it's relevant and if they think it's accurate and that kind of thing. So. So here's a very good comparison of um, activity-based costing versus traditional. So in terms of the number of cost pools, activity-based costing, there'll be numerous cost pools and it's based on key activities involved in a product in, or service. Under traditional costing, there's gonna be a small number of cost pools and it's based on key production and service departments. With respect to how we treat manufacturing overhead under activity-based costing, it's allocated to products only if it's caused by the product. So just thinking of that example of uh, factory rent and administrative building rent under the custom brass example, we didn't allocate those two um, overhead costs to products. But under a traditional method, all manufacturing overhead would be allocated to products. So we would have taken that cost of um, the office rent and the factory rent and allocated it to the two different products based on some measure. For activity measures used for applying overhead under activity-based costing, we're gonna have a mix of unit level using things such as labor hours and non-unit level, which um, could use batches, for instance, batches of a particular uh, product that we're producing. And then it's gonna vary by activity under traditional costing, it's typically unit level and it varies by department. Treatment of non-manufacturing overhead. And uh, the example here is shipping costs. Under activity-based costing, we will it'll be allocated to products or customers if it's caused by those products or customers. So if the shipping isn't caused by them, we're not gonna allocate it to their 
uh, products or the customers of those products. And under traditional, you expense it as a period cost, the uh, non-manufacturing overhead in terms of direct materials and labor under activity costing and traditional costing, we're going to want to directly trace those costs to or to objects. And in terms of using activity-based costing versus traditional for financial reporting, uh, typically we're going to require modifications to our activity-based costing reports uh, because they don't um, conform to GAAP is the big one. And under traditional costing, typically no modifications will be required because we base traditional costing very much on GAAP. And of course, with any process uh, that we use, any model, any um, application, there are going to be some limitations. So with activity-based costing, one of the big limitations is it takes a lot of resources to implement the system and then to maintain it. And there may be resistance to unfamiliar numbers and reports. So I think you would have noticed when we were going through the um, custom brass example that the way the numbers are laid out is quite new. And the way the reports are laid out is very different from traditional costing. So change often brings resistance. Um, there's often a desire to want to fully allocate all costs to products. So for example, with that um, office, uh, administrative office rent, right? It's, I do it. I know I want to assign all costs that we have to a product because it makes things easy. If you can do that, it makes things a lot um, easier to track. And, um, but it's uh, not always the way to go as we saw under our activity-based costing examples for custom brass, because it does create issues. Additionally, you could be, there could be misinter a misinterpretation of unfamiliar numbers for people who weren't uh, comfortable with the activity-based costing system that's been implemented. And of course, as we mentioned a few times, ABC does not conform to GAAP. So very often you're gonna need two costing systems. Um, if you have to do external reports, such as audit financial statements, you're definitely going to need two costing systems. So in summary, um, under traditional costing methods, all manufacturing costs are allocated to products, even when those manufacturing costs aren't caused by the specific product. That's a very key difference. Activity-based costing estimates the costs of the resources consumed by cost objects, such as products, consumers, or customers. And ABC is also concerned with overhead, both manufacturing overhead and selling in administrative. And the accounting for direct labor and direct materials would typically be unaffected by the use of activity-based costing. Um, what's changing is after the allocation of direct materials and direct labor, right? Because we're going to allocate overhead for selling and manufacturing, selling and administrative and manufacturing overhead. Also to develop a activity-based costing system, um, companies will typically choose a small set of activities that summarize a good chunk of the work performed in overhead departments. And also recall, we have an activity cost pool that we associate with activities. We had four or five cost pools for custom brass in that example. And activity rate is computed for each cost pool by dividing the cost assigned to that pool by the measure of activity for the cost pool. So if you recall, we um, went through that quick process for custom brass as well. And we um, computed the, the activity rate for each cost pool. And then the second stage allocation Activity rates are used to apply cost to both costs to cost objects such as products and consumers or customers, pardon. Um, so you recall, we also did that with the, uh, uh, the single customer example. And I already forgot the name, Winyard or something like that, that uh, we went over some specific data for one customer. And so we learned how to do it for both products and customers. The, we have time, so we're going to go through this because I think it'll be useful. 
Um, oh, sorry, I skipped a part there. <laughs> We're just going to go over quickly, go over using a modified form of activity-based costing to determine product costs for external reports. So we can use modified form of ABC uh, to develop product costs for external financial reports. Um, recall that our activity-based cost in product costs include organization sustaining costs and unused capacity costs. And they exclude non-manufacturing costs, even if they are caused by the products. So in this example, Maxtar Industries that produces premium and standard smoker barbecue units. We have estimated manufacturing overhead of 1,520,000 and total estimated direct labor hours of 400,000. We have direct materials costs per unit, direct labor costs per unit, and direct labor hours per unit that we've determined for premium and standard. And we know the number of units produced for each premium and standard. So using a traditional cost system, we can get a predetermined plant-wide overhead rate using direct labor hours. And we can calculate that to be 3.8 based on that $1,520,000 in um, estimated manufacturing overhead from that slide and 400,000 direct labor hours to give us 380 per direct labor hour. So Maxter's traditional cost system would report unit product costs based on these figures. We would take uh, manufacturing overhead per unit for each uh, premium and standard, and would base it on the number of labor hours multiplied by the predetermined overhead rate that we just did. So it's two direct labor hours for each premium unit and 1.5 direct labor hours for each standard unit. So under the traditional cost system, we would use a unit product cost of 7160 for premium and 5370 for standard. But now um, an activity-based costing system has been developed. And this is the information we have. We have expected activity under premium and standard and our estimated overhead costs are direct labor support, machine setups and parts administration. So we can calculate activity rates for each of these um, each of these cost classes. So for direct labor support, our estimated cost is eight hundred thousand, and our expected activity is four hundred thousand. So we could determine an activity rate of two dollars per direct labor hour for machine setups. We're determining six hundred dollars per machine setup and parts administration is $1,200 per part type. So now using our calc newly calculated activity rates, we can assign overhead to premium and standard barbecues, our smoker barbecues. And we do that by using the expected activity for each of these products and the activity rates we've calculated under our activity-based costing system. So you'll see how we can assign um, those three overhead costs to each product using activity rates. And our per unit costs using activity-based costing comes out to 78.56 for premium and 51.96 for standard. And as, as you'll recall, that's quite a big difference from the traditional costing system. So here's the comparison. I was just waiting for that. So under activity-based costing versus traditional, just for um, Maxtar and these two products, you'll see that uh, premium barbecues are undercosted under the traditional costing system, and standard are overcosted under the traditional costing system. So 
you're going to see there's a big difference in how we're allocating costs under these two systems, right? Um, so we're allocating about 10% additional costs under the activity-based costing system compared to traditional and about 5%, not quite 5% fewer costs under the, uh, to the standard um, barbecue, smoker barbecue. So that does make a big difference, right? In terms of how we um, calculate margins and profitability when we have a big change in our per unit cost like that. So that's the, um, a really good example of the kind of differences you'll see in activity-based costing versus um, traditional costing. And